What's up, Cycling Junkies? We're back. We got another episode of Pack Chatter, and this is one of my favorites ever. Such a cool guest, uh, amazing, uh, amazing conversation. Really uh, such a treat to be able to, to speak with him and, and uh, learn a lot today, and I can't wait to get you into that. Before we start, though, let's hit up the sponsors. First, we're sponsored by Nisbra, or the New York State Bicycle Racing Association. Nisbra does all the behind-the-scenes work to keep us racing in New York, whether you're talking about grants, upgrades, uh, permits, officials, state championships, the whole deal. So hit them up on their website for tons of great resources and follow them on Facebook. We're also brought to you by Legacy Bikes. That's Legacy with an I. L-E-G-A-C-I bikes.com. Ran by my man Todd Shesky. And Todd will hook you up with a balance bike for your little one. He's got lots of brands and he's even got a new custom painted frame program. Yeah, how cool is that? You can get a custom painted frame for your kid's balance bike so that that kid will love it. It'll be cool. So Get a hold of Todd, check him out on the website, hit him up on Facebook, and get your little one going on two wheels. We're also brought to you by The Rock Criterium in Fondo, July 27 and July 28. It's going to be a killer weekend. We're going to kick it off with the Fondo. Uh, We've got five rides ranging from 19 to 90 miles. We've got two dirt options that are killer, some of the coolest gravel options that we've ever developed um, for anything, not just the Fondo. We've got live music, we've got wine, we've got beer. Um, It's going to be a big ride, a fun day of riding with your friends, and then a big party afterward at one of the coolest wineries in New York State with Deer Run. So get registered. We're only taking 100 people that day, um, so please get signed up quickly. Then we're going to roll it back with the Rock Criterium at the coolest venue in cycling. Um, five turns. You can see the whole course from the sidelines. Bring your friends. Bring your family. Show them what you do. They can really watch it and enjoy it and appreciate it. We'll have uh, food from Smoking in the Valley Barbecue. We've got Vertical Cafe. We've got Silver Lake Brewing. Um, so lots of stuff there to entertain everybody. We've got kids races. We're giving away PlayStations in the kids race um, or the teenage race anyway, not the little kids race. We got a little kids race too. Um, the course is a lot of fun. There's no traffic. There's no curbs. There's no telephone poles. So it's nice and safe as far as crit courses go. But it's hard. It's technical. It's it's the coolest venue out there. I'm telling you, if you haven't seen it, get there. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, get registered. Both those days are up on RideLCC.com and on BikeReg.com. All right. Now our guest. This guy is an absolute legend. Uh, I believe he has 21 national titles between a few different disciplines. Um, He's uh, one of the most dominant, if not the most dominant, uh, crit racer in history. Um, And he grew up on the track, and now he's turning his attention back to the track. Um, His first passion, his first love and he's coming after uh, one of the few things he hasn't won yet, and that's an Olympic gold. Uh, so uh, it was really cool to listen to him and, and to get a chance to, to meet him and speak with him a little bit about that goal and that journey. Um, I'm a total dummy when it comes to track, so it was great to, to learn about it from a guy uh, who's one of the best in the world. Um, if you're a tracky and, and you like the technical uh, part of racing and you know track racing, you're going to get a really, really uh, good education here uh, as he and Todd go back and forth on some of the technical stuff. But you also, if you're like me, uh, it's a great introduction too, especially with those Olympics coming up and, and with, with him racing and all the rest of the Americans that we want to be rooting for and watching uh, in 2020. So it's a great way to kind of get that foundation and that understanding um, as we lead up to those games. Um, and then we also get into a little bit of, of hunting and shooting and some other stuff, just some uh, some fun stuff. So it was a lot of fun. It was an absolute pleasure and, and honor to be able to speak with him. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it again and definitely be, be rooting for him to win gold here uh, in 2020. So without further ado, please enjoy the conversation with the legend himself, Daniel Holloway. You'll never go out on a training ride and dig that deep. Awesome, we, we won gold. We... They're, they're life rides. I'm like, dude, I'm still figuring this out. I lose sight of the fact that it's, it's whoever goes faster. 
You know, this isn't a road race. This isn't a mountain bike race. The sensei of sprint, Todd Shasky. My eyes are coming out of my head. Just get in here. We're on. Uh, we're back with Pack Chatter. Um, what's up, Todd? You, uh, how are you feeling today? Well, I'm doing better because it's finally actually feeling a little bit like summer. Yesterday, I was uh, as uh, as oddly as it might seem, I was training in leg warmers and arm warmers and my vest because um, it was a light rain and 58 degrees here. Little would you know that it's the end of June, but uh, but today felt a little bit nicer. Nice to get a nice little spin in tonight and in shorts and a jersey. So uh, maybe summer's here. Cross uh, my fingers. Sounds like it in Western New York. It's summer. It's 58. We're good. Yeah, I don't. All right. <laughs> so our guest today, man, I'm super stoked, like an absolute legend. Uh, needs no background information. If you don't know who he is, figure it out. Look it up, man. Daniel Holloway, what's up, brother? Yeah, not too much. Um, I'm just glad I'm not in New York. That weather sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is, man. It is. You are. You are. For those who don't know, you're in California. Uh, Boulder, Colorado. Colorado. Okay. You're yeah. from California. From California. I've been in Boulder for four years now. So it's been a really good transition. Right. Cool. Did, did, did you escape? You, you were in T-Town last week, weren't you? Yeah, we were in T-Town. Um, yeah, we were able to get out Sunday, miss some weather there. And then funny enough, came back to a little bit of weather, but like in Colorado, it lasts 30 minutes and then you're back to sunshine and good temperatures. So, you know, you just got to plan around that 30 minute window here yeah well we just got to plan around like 30 day windows here that, that's <laughs> <laughs> you know but but you've you've raced t-town enough times to know how fast it can change down there where it's like those thunderstorms come rolling in right yeah basically anybody like anywhere on the east coast or you know kind of the south is like you think it's really nice and all of a sudden one cloud develops the next thing you know you're like ducking for lightning so <laughs> yeah um yeah, luckily we were pretty lucky the past week at T-Town that we didn't get rained out. or uh, It was just pretty breezy, which makes for some interesting track racing when you just got a wicked crosswind. But, you know, it's all, yeah. it's all part of the fun. Yeah, yeah you, were behind, uh, you were telling me you were behind a pretty high-profile uh, a crash uh, this weekend, huh? Yeah, Phil Gaming kind of made his debut post-retirement uh, back to the track um, to do... I think mostly team pursuit stuff and then uh probably just wanted to dabble on some drop bar stuff um and kind of got just thrown into the fire and uh just found himself in a bad position then even a worse position not that long later so yeah that, that crash happened at t-town then yeah um coming out of corner two was like a sprint lap and he was behind some guys that were kind of like losing speed and he went to step out and he didn't see that the training guys coming over the top and you know, when somebody's going 10 K an hour faster than you are from behind, it's pretty difficult to keep that one upright. And he just kind yeah. of really at the end of the day, bad luck. I don't think he really did anything all that wrong, except for, you know, just kind of step out and do a moving train and it's almost unavoidable. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's one is so was it during a, was it during a practice session then? I take oh it? no points it was like in the omnium qualifier points race it was like the oh, second okay. sprint. so we weren't even that far into the race and uh, right. yeah so yeah i saw it come across i saw the the pictures come across my instagram feed and i wasn't really looking too closely at it and he always just doing goofy stuff so i kind of half thought he was like joking around you know like he you know was posing in a hospital bed or something and then i read about it i was like oh man he got he got pretty messed up yeah, he just didn't want to let Froome have all the limelight, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> get, grab it any way you can get it, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so he's he raising money for a good charity, so. Yeah, uh, that's cool. So, well, I'm glad you avoided it because um, you had uh, you had kind of a, a nasty crash not not so long ago yourself, right? A few weeks back, you, you, you took a you took a bit of a hit, and but you're you looks like you're going well again here. So. Um, yeah, everything's going pretty good. Yeah, that's that's always yeah. good news. So, um, so you you got out of T town though. You spent the one weekend. Any any other uh, UCI T town weekends for you, or what's uh, what's the kind of the near term schedule looking like here? Um, no, just those three days. We did a Tuesday, Friday, Saturday to get some two Madisons and Omnium in, and then in two weeks, uh, July fourth weekend, we have track nationals in LA. So that's a big one for us. Um, 
in terms of mass start, um, it kind of is the platform for some selections for the Continental Championships uh, in September. So it's, yeah, one of those things, it's a bit early, um, trying to like get good fitness going into the Winter World Cup season, but you know, it's just kind of how we're set up. And um, yeah, so that's kind of like the, the nearest term thing is just track nationals in a couple of weeks. And then depending on how that, that goes kind of shapes the rest of my summer that, you know, if nationals goes perfect and I get the results I need to get, then I'm on my way to Pan Am games and Pan Am championships, uh, first weeks of August and September. And then after that, it'd be yeah, full world cup, um, prep and yeah, fitness for there. If nationals kind of goes a bit sideways, then I'll probably see myself at a few more crits, um, in the summer, uh, rocking the roadhouse flag and, and going out there and having some fun. Right, cool. Well, I don't. Uh, it's hard. For, it's hard to imagine, given the previous successes at nationals and uh, and World Cups, that, that that would exactly go sideways. Um, you know, me me saying my mine going sideways would be like, wow, I I wasn't even in the medals, but I think it's for you. It's like not winning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I, now were you here doing Madison with with Adrian and uh, yep. is, So you guys are getting that practice in all along here then so um and uh you guys have had kind of really well not even kind of you've actually had really good success in that how did you guys kind of come together as as madison partners um and and you know are you guys always partners in madison or are you kind of switching up how's that how's that working um yeah so we were kind of funny enough is like you know he was a big 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 engine on uhc doing the lead outs and we definitely had the crit rivalry where he was actually kind of one of the most quiet guys on on that team that you know post races you could say good job or whatever and he just kind of give you a head nod and and what have you and then you know we just kind of got stuck together um doing the team pursuit stuff and spent a lot more time together funny enough we just had a lot in common um saw things you know very similarly um and then it was an awkward nationals a couple years ago it was like it was a one-off like in October and kind of just like, Hey, well, yeah, you want to ride together? And we ended up like clicking pretty well without really training together. Um, and that just kind of rolled forward into a few more opportunities. And then, yeah, we just started clicking really well. Well, it was just like, yeah, again, we both tactically think very similarly. Uh, we don't have to talk that much in a race that we kind of can see the other's body language on the track to know, kind of how they're feeling or what they're thinking. Um, so we play off each other really well. And, yeah, it's bowed to a really successful uh, relationship. And, yeah, we try to stick together as as much as we can because, you know, as comfortable as we are together and we do click, um, every race is an opportunity to, to grow and learn. Um, you know, in the U.S., we don't have tons of even weekday track nights to just kind of play around. So, we were trying to use it every opportunity to still grow and learn together and um, get it figured out. So when the winter comes and the pressure is super high, like, yeah, we're just as close as we, we've always been instead of um, kind of riding with other guys. Right. And uh, when, when you guys head into the, the winter season, is there opportunities to do some of the six days as well? Or is it just the World Cup season is just too packed and too much activity there to, to worry about that? Or kind of how does that all fit together for you guys? Um, it's potential that we might ride um, a couple six days this winter. Uh, you know, the World Cup schedule is a bit more spread out um, and things like that. So we might be able to sneak a couple in. Um, last year we only did, uh, a three day, I believe, or two, three days. Uh Um, and so, you know, those are definitely fun and and really good. And yeah, it's just a ton of laps on the track and you get, you know, a lot of time to, to get some repetitions in and get stuck in a lot of different scenarios. So kind of ideally we would do uh, a couple six days this, this winter, but, um, I think it's a bit early to kind of call that, um, at the moment, but we definitely like to. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, Madison's obviously a big one, and you guys have been doing awesome at that. And even even in January, you guys uh, you guys got a uh, a bronze, I believe it was, right in in New Zealand, or or uh, yeah, was it, it was a World Cup in New Zealand, right? That you guys got a bronze. 
Um, yep. So you guys are gelling really well. Um, did, did you write? Now I was at the one in uh, Milton um, this winter, and I don't remember the date of it now. Um, Might have been December. I don't recall exactly when it was. Uh, did you ride in Milton with with Adrian then? I didn't, I didn't remember now. Um, yeah, we also got a, a bronze in Milton. Yep, because I remember. Yeah, and it was I, that was man. You guys were riding us, awesome. awesome, and it was like. But I was just from from my standpoint, I was kind of wondering, like, you know, what do you guys play for your strength? I mean, it, it seems like you're the guy to go try to get the lap. Is that also one a, a, a role for Adrian, or is that something to say if we're going for the lap, you're trying to take the bulk of it, or who do you try to set up more for the for the sprints and and or kind of what's your you know without giving away the farm to the competition here. <laughs> Um, you know, or you could just tell us something completely opposite and then they'd be like, oh man, totally set, <laughs> totally, totally going to set up even for the sprint and throw off their game. So, um, but it, it didn't seem like you guys were heavily favoring either one of you, I, I guess, from a, from a, a, a casual observance standpoint. Yeah. I mean, we both have our, our strengths and weaknesses and like any good marriages, like each person's got to put in, you know, a hundred percent to get, you know, to get, um, the outcome you want so we definitely you know pick you know and we know our strengths and weaknesses and so we go okay how do we maximize your strength with limiting your weakness and vice versa and so um yeah i'm pretty good you know visually on reading a race um and i guess i'm more kind of the setup man that you know i'm, I'm you know kind of really reading the moment reading the you know the the time in the race where I feel is a, is a good time to hit out. And it's honestly been either of us. Um, you know, if it's me in the race and the time is right, then, you know, I hit out and try to get the separation and throw him in. Or um, I try to put myself in a good spot to throw him in at a, at a really good time to, to attack and get the separation. Um, so it's really not, oh, you know, this is, I'm the only guy that gets to attack and create the space. And then he, he holds it or what, what have you. So, um, but he's, he's done a really good job too reading the race and, and picked a few good key moments for us, uh, racing together on, um, kind of when to hit out. Um, so it's very symbiotic and when we're out there, I would definitely say he's on average, definitely the bigger engine, um, that kind of, you know, extends our gap and, um, you know, I'm there most of the time kind of, you know, hanging on, uh to, to what we get and picking and it's very um you just got to be reading the race the whole time whether you're in or you're out on what effort you're putting it in because you're just on the razor's edge the whole time of you know judging do i need to like tap into the red to maintain this or you know extend our gap or you know do i stay just below it because you know the field isn't going super hard that i don't need to, need to go quite all in i just need to like maintain this effort um and a lot of that is just in the moment decision making um you know kind of 100 meters at a time on what what you're doing out there right do you ever get one of those those times where uh <laughs> he thinks this is the moment and he strikes out there and you're like wow i was kind of a little tapped and you're like Thank, thank, thanks, Adrian. I really, I really didn't really need to be out here right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's just, I mean, that happens. It, it, it does happen because he sees the moment, and you know, most of the time, it's probably my fault in the sense that I didn't communicate that I was a bit in the box or in the red, um, you know. And so that could be me trying to feel out a situation like, oh, okay, I just need six more laps to really figure it myself out to know if I'm really, really tapped or if I'm, it's just a moment. I just need to like, I need a little bit of help to carry, carry myself through. So it's not like I'm telling like, Hey, I'm in the box. And then he's still out there like attacking. Right. Um, Cause that's like, that's a big part of it is understanding your, your partner. And even though there may be the absolute perfect timing to go out on the attack, if your partner can't handle it, you know, then that moment in time actually isn't perfect. Um, right. So it's, there's a lot of, you know, there's, we've both been in those situations where one guy is just, you know, biting at the bit to, to just let it loose. And the other guy's like, Hey man, I just, I can't do it. Like you got to protect me. Like I'm just, I'm on an off day. Right. And so we've definitely had our fair share of, uh, of moments where we come in after the race and it's like, Oh man, I was like wanting to race. And it's like, dude, I was on 
the worst day. And, <laughs> you know, it's, and we, we both, I think, from our experience in the sport, understand that we can't control those. And you got to just pull your teammate through it and say, hey, man, like, I understand, like, I'm not mad at you. Like, because right. if it was perfect, then we both have great legs and we'd both be out there trying to, like, race as hard as we could. But some days it just we don't sync up. And that's when you really just test um, kind of all your skills. Yeah, that when that one guy is off, um, how, how well can you guys as a team get the best possible result? And um, that actually kind of helped with, at Worlds this year where I was just like on my hands and knees from like 10K in and Hedge was just like a master of, you know, carrying me, uh, you know, for 40K for us to kind of, I mean, we didn't get a result by any means, but we definitely did better than the year before. And, um so that was a huge moment for us that even on the worst days, like we can still get through a really hard race. Yeah. And I think that's a really, uh, it's a really cool point too, is um, hearing from, from your standpoint of, you know, that you're, you're out there racing and you know, there's just times you're just on the rivet and you're, you're starting to wonder if you're going to be able to hang on, you know? And I think sometimes amateurs kind of don't, don't realize that, as pros, you're going through that. You know those very same things when you you, you want to quit because you're just like, man, I'm, I'm just I'm so tapped right now. And you think if if somebody else surges right now, that's going to be it for me. And, that's my yeah. race experience every single time, all the time. <laughs> like from from the time it starts until it ends. Like that's that's the only experience that I have. So that's that's nice that it happens to you every once in a while. That's yeah. Funny. I wanted to start a podcast like kind of on that premise of like. You talk to somebody that gets like top five, and then you get a guy that gets like in the back ten, and you have a podcast with those two people about what their race experience was, and it's like, oh, there was this breakaway and that breakaway, and we decided not to chase, and the guy in the back's like, wait, there was a breakaway, you know? It just <laughs> like because it's there's so many races in one race, and it'd be good, I think, for both ends of the spectrum to like the guys from the front hearing how the race in the back is going and what that race is like. Um, and then kind of vice versa is like the guy in the back to learn what's happening in the front. And hopefully they both can learn from it and, and, you know, kind of grow, uh, into just like kind of better riders and better people in some ways. Yeah. That's, that's basically what mine and Todd's conversations are after every race. He tells me what's going on in the front. And I tell him how I was trying not to throw up in the back and, and we go from there. But that does bring me to a question about that. You, you talk a lot about reading a race and, and I, I imagine it's different with the different disciplines that, that you're racing, whether you're talking about crits or on the track or different formats on the track. Um, and, and I'm always really interested in, in that concept and sort of learning that and training that. So, like, can you kind of explain to to people who maybe don't understand it or, or don't certainly don't understand it at your level, but maybe even at sort of that weekend warrior level of, of what is it like to, to really read a race as opposed to decide to kind of survive a race? And like, how do you, how do you develop that skill? Um, for me, I was like, I guess, super fortunate that I was able to race the track since I was 13 and I could race, you know, four races, two times a night, plus criteriums that I could race the junior race and then whatever category I was in. So I was racing 10 times a week, um, you know, and every chance is like an opportunity to like learn, get, get thrown in, learn and, and get in the mix and try stuff and not being worried about what the outcome is. Cause it's like a Tuesday night. It doesn't really matter. Um, if you win every Tuesday night race, um, cause you don't know how to like test yourself or try a different tactic or see also what your other competitors are, are capable of. Um, and I think that comes like from this developing this skill set of existing in a three foot bubble while also existing in a 30 meter bubble. So I think a lot of guys get caught up as soon as their heart rate goes up, their bubble gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're just existing in this three meter bubble around them where their head's really not up watching what's developing in front of them. And so they're only racing that three meter space. So if the wheel's going away from them, they're chasing it. And then as soon as that comes back to them, they're hitting the brakes and then they're chasing and they're, they're breaking, they're chasing and breaking where is if you existed in this 30 meter bubble, you could look up and see, oh, the front's coasting. So I don't necessarily need to be hard on my pedals because we're just going to run into them. So just keep riding 
to 300 watts out of the corner instead of going to like 600 watts to just chase, you know, the front of the race that's just coasting. And then when you get there, can you move up? Can you just like kind of coast around some people or can you just keep riding that, you know, not that 300 watts is easy for everybody, but, you know, kind of that pace that you're not dying to just gain some positions. And then when the front accelerates, you just slot in relatively easy 15 spaces up, you know, and you keep kind of doing that until you find yourself in that front bit of like washing machine where it's like, yeah, you're going to be at the front and you're going to go back a little bit and then you're going to go to the front and you're going to get in this kind of spin cycle. It's a lot easier than the spin cycle that's at the back of the race. And yeah. it's really kind of, you know, I was so lucky again, just like I grew up in the Bay area at a time and an era where there was so many pros and so many good cat ones. And I was surrounded by just a really good group of guys um, on the Lombardi team that really kind of took me in and could show me these things firsthand kind of in races, but also like in group rides. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot of the skills in group rides on, you know, how to move up and where to move up. Um, and then you just start applying those things into the races you're doing. So I'm definitely, you know, very aware that I was very fortunate to kind of be in the right place, right time kind of thing to get a really good set of mentors um, and a lot of, you know, unique opportunities to just kind of go through the fire at a really young age and then start applying that to higher and higher levels. Well, there's a couple, couple of really cool aspects I think there too that you that you introduce there with um, group rides and and the, the Tuesday night worlds um, where you, you're trying stuff and you've gone through that with so many people over the years um, and just saying man just try stuff in the training race like like I'm not a breakaway guy and when I when I go to a race that I'm paying money for I'm not typically going to try to get away on my own but I will in races that are training races and ra other races because it builds that strength right. Right? And it gives you the chance to try it. And if, oh, if it works, it works. If it does, and if it works, you just get better at it. And if it doesn't, you're like, it's okay. But it's a, it's a great time to try that. And when you talk about, you know, using group rides and using these opportunities, like you're racing, you're racing the track and you're racing crits. And so you're racing, when you say 10 times in a week, because you're getting six of those opportunities, seven of those opportunities at the track. Um, cause the races are short and it's something I try to encourage people. And Tony knows I'm a, I'm a big passionate track person I, it's it's like it's it's always like they, they, i always say tracks for the anointed right and so it's my little, <laughs> it's, my little it's my little that's my little phrase right but and i love other disciplines as well but uh the tracks of passion but but the fact is you can learn so much in a condensed period especially when you're doing like you're talking about is taking some of those chances just like I, i'm gonna try something different and it, and it's okay because you don't want to race in three or four more times tonight and yeah so what? You know, it didn't work. Okay, well, you know, I'm going to go recover and I'm going to come back out and I'm going to try something different. Or maybe I'm going to even try the same thing. Maybe I'm going to try it a little different way. And I think it, it, that that condensed learning is fantastic opportunity. Um, and you were able to embrace that and not worry about like, oh, I got to try to win all these right now. Um, you know, win the important stuff and use this for training is, is really, really cool stuff. Um, so well, I wanted to also ask you about, though, because like we, we tried to talk about that Madison a bit. Um, but Madison's relatively kind of a, a newer discipline for you, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, you kind of came back to the track, but I think it was after they changed the Omnium and you're, so and is your, is your goal for 2020 Madison or is it the Omnium or, or is it something, something else? Um, well, I actually started Madison when like I was a junior, like junior national champion and then. When I was like 20, I guess, Colby Pierce really kind of took me under his wing and we started doing the Pro Six Day Circuit. And um, I did that for, I think, four years straight. We did almost like six, four to six, six days a winter. And so we had a ton of experience. Um, and then, yeah, so Madison's really kind of where my heart is. And the track is like really where my heart is. And, um, Colby and I were on that track to kind of go to the try for the Olympics when we were racing together. And then that was after, uh, Athens, I think they changed it. They were, they removed the Madison. Um, yeah. and then, so that's where kind of like that progress stopped because the funding through USAC was like, Oh, we only fund, um, Olympic events. So, we, you know, 
that program kind of came to a halt and it was at a time where it was like, all right, well, you know, let's just try to go pro tour. Let's try to get to Europe on the road. And I really put my eggs in, in that basket for, you know, a handful of years. And then, um, yeah, I think it was after Rio that they announced the new format that really suited my skill set. I'm definitely no guy against the clock. So, um, I didn't really have an appetite for the, the previous Omnium format to, to really spend a bunch of time on the track during those years. So kind of once it was changed, um, it definitely sparked my, my interest uh, quite a bit to kind of come back to the track. And uh, on the road side of things, um, in, you know, in whatever circumstances they were, I, I achieved quite a bit in two years that, um, yeah, there wasn't that many more crits for me to chase. And so kind of all lined up for kind of perfect timing for me to kind of move from the crits in the road and, and go full gas into the track. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's a sign, man. I think it's a sign. You're, <laughs> I think it's a sign you're getting a gold medal in, uh, oh. in 2020. That's what I'm thinking. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know if Madison was that uh, was that much of a passion um, for you. I thought it was something you kind of fell kind of fell into. And I, I was suspicious that the the change in the Omnium format was something that kind of kind of brought you back in. Um, yeah, and, and and it makes this interesting thing because they got rid of all the timed events for people that are not familiar with the Omni. They got rid of the the uh, the kilo, the three k, and the flying lap, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm never a fan of the I was never a fan of the pursuit um, part of it myself, but I like the other ones because it was a yeah. good chance to get the <laughs> some power, right? But yeah. um, but I always think maybe give me your your view of it, but I always think like the 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 elimination race is kind of this kind of this wild card kind of I always wonder like why did they choose an elimination race? Like of of all the things they could do, they put an elimination race in there. I always think it's kind of this it's it's a weird event. Yeah, you know? I mean it's I think it it really showcases a bike racer. I mean it's the bike racers it's the racers race, you know. Um because in, in some way it kind of has a speed limit because the guy on the front's not trying to go as fast as he can. He's not trying to get out there and score points. He's only trying to ride as fast as he needs to. And it creates this thing where, you know, people are hiding for draft and, and jockeying for position while also not trying to be at the back, but not trying to be at the front. And it, it, you have to have so many different skills to master that and be highly successful um, at whatever, um, you know, level you're at, whether you're kind of the, the B grade racer at your local track or, you know, domestically a cat one or, you know, at the, the pro level is you have to, you know, have everything buttoned up and dialed to be really successful at that. And, um, you know, if you look across the world cups and, and everything, it's like, there's really never an anomaly at the top five. And it's because those guys are true masters, right? Like in, the guys that are always coming out early are, you know, kind of always the same five. And, um, you know, so I think it's the perfect addition for the Omnium because it's the bike racers race. Um, and, you know, if you run 10 scratch races, you're going to get eight different results. You know, if you run a tempo race, it's, you know, that's where the, you know, the guys with really good speed and can survive, can be really successful. And then the guys, the massive motors can just, you know, lay down, just big, big power and big speed for a long time and make that um, a world of hurt. So you have kind of like everything in the spectrum for track racing in the Omnium. And I think it's, I think it's perfect. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting, interesting view. I guess I never, I never thought of the, the elimination race in, in that vein of, you know, cause it, cause it is, it's just so much, it's so much tactical kind of maneuvering and trying to be, mm, not, not, yeah, trying to be in the in that in that mix, but not. And then as it's getting smaller and smaller, you have to obviously be aware too. You got to be paying attention. It's not a race you can kind of fall asleep in either. Um, yep. it, it quickly changes, and uh, I think we've probably all gotten sucked into the. Um, I'm a little bit. I'm a little bit not where I want to be, and then you drop down to the bottom of the track because it looks open, and next thing you know, there's nowhere to go, and uh, yep. you get lured <laughs> in, and you're like, you're like, damn it. <laughs> no, yeah. No, exactly. No, 
I'd like to go forward, but I can't. And it's like not, you know, resisting those urges and things. But it's a, it, it's it's a race that I, uh, I I always have this kind of mixed feeling about, and I'm always like, I don't know how I always feel about this race. And uh, you know, the scratch race, I'm always feeling like I feel like I'm always pretty lucky in that I I can get the and it's and it's a one punch race so i'm always like all right good one big punch or make a big move in the race and get get a group away or something like that right and and a tempo seems like that's always a hard one to figure out because it's it's a point every lap and then the get the, the 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 variability is very high where guys are scoring points and you're like all right who's got points and i gotta get up there and get some points and and how many is enough points and so it's not it seems like it's less control than the points race to me um yeah the tempo you know. is like one that I'm having the hardest time kind of wrapping my head around and, and kind of mastering, if you will, to understand it, not necessarily winning everyone, but just like really trying to understand the event and then see where I fit with my skill set to go in there. And um, it's very unique. It's the second race. So you've already got this, this scratch race result. And more often than not, you have kind of one of the favorites that have missed out in the scratch race. So it's like you have some guys that are at the top, you know, like where they want to be. And there's always this outlier that's in 12th because they took a chance. They took a flyer and then got caught with one to go or they just got boxed out and you ended up with a bad result. Um, so you kind of always have this one or two strong guys that's really kind of out of the, the omnium, so to speak. And they go out early in the tempo race and then it's kind of like, a, OK, who's going to chase? I don't want to chase. Like you chase. You know, right. and then then it just becomes, you know, this very weird mix of that dynamic of who's going to chase who and when and who they, who the the top guys on GC are okay with potentially, you know, going top three in this thing because, you know, they know in their their research they're you know they're learning that oh that guy never gets top ten in the elimination so it's like I can give away ten points to him, you know, and then on average like he only scores eight points in the point in every points race that he's ever done at the end of an omnium. So, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable giving this guy some leash in this event. You know, I got to keep these other guys close. So sometimes you're only racing, you know, four guys for an eighth place because you don't really care about those other guys, or you're really trying to win or get the, the, you know, the top three result because you're like sitting seventh and you really need a a top three result um, to get yourself kind of back in the overall picture as the event goes on. So, It's just one of those ones that's like everyone is different um, and you kind of just have to make the best educated guess on who's going to do what and kind of be able to have three plans that are all A plans and and really from the first point see what's going on and and be like, okay, this this is the plan. Like this is like in five laps I figured out kind of what everybody's what I think everybody's strategy is going to be. These guys are going to watch each other. This guy's got to hit out, you know, and these guys typically look for something late. And like, where do I fit into that to get um, through the race uh, with good points and without digging, you know, a huge hole. Right. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a hard one to not dig a hole. I, it was just, as you were talking about that, you know, who's going to chase thing. Remind me of this, uh, I remember doing one of those uh, Ontario Cups up at Milton because I'm only I'm only two and a half hours away from there, which is a real blessing to be that close to that facility. Um, yeah. And uh, so you know, some guys away scoring all the points. So you know, I I finally take it upon myself that I'm like I can't wait for everybody else. Got to make my own luck. So I take off after this guy. Doesn't somebody get on me right before I get him and then pips me for the point? And then then I'm blowing up. And somebody else goes by and they get the next one. So I like, I got enough, you know, I was like, all I did was yeah. spend, <laughs> I was so stuffed that I was like, that's why I was like, God, I got to figure out this race. So I'm glad I'm not the only one still trying to figure out the tempo race or like really get it dialed. Cause it seems like sometimes I do okay with it. And other times it's like, man, once and it's like, once you get on the back foot, then it's like super hard because every lap's just a point. You don't get, there's no consolation. There's no, yeah. well, yeah, you know, <laughs> Oh, I got second. I still get a point. I got a points race. We're like, oh, I got I got pipped, but at least I got something on the board. It's like, no, I got I got zero. I might as well have been sitting in the pack, just you know, biding my time, you know. Yep. So it's uh, it's it. But I, I love hearing too about how, you know, you're you're looking at what the other riders, other results are and things, um, and it really speaks to the level of detail and 
and I think it plays into what what you love about it and the, the passion you have for the track is 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 the detail that's involved with the various types of races on the track and how much thinking is going on while you're under stress, um, which is ex- exceptionally hard to do. Um, keeping track of who's got points, who's doing what, what types of riders they are. Um, and I think sometimes those aren't the kind of marginal gains that people typically think of in cycling. They're thinking of, you know, kind of the, the sky model, right. Where we're like, we're going to try to get something more arrow. And I'm sure you're doing that as well. Um, yeah. Looking, you know, tire selections and pressures and um, equipment and speed suits and all those types of things as well. But you're also looking at it from this other standpoint of, points and who your competition is right yeah yeah i mean i wasn't gifted with like the engine of like cam meyer that can just sit on 400 watts for you know huge amounts of time I, you know i was gifted with some speed and um you know kind of that was it and i really try to nurture my motor as much as i can but i think a lot of my success in the last you know kind of four years or since 2014 was um you know when i signed up with athlete octane and, and chad hartley is we really started diving into the weeds, so to speak, on, hey, if this makes us a little faster, and this makes us a little faster, and this makes us a little faster, um, you know, started really piecing the puzzle together um, kind of at the domestic, you know, amateur level, um, that when the opportunities arise, you could really maximize maximize those moments that if, for whatever reason, with my skill set, I found myself in a breakaway. It's like I had all the tools to, helped me survive when the breakaway guys and the big motors were really pushing. It's like, I could, I could exist in that because yeah, I've got good tires. I got a good helmet. I've got a good bike and you know, all these things. And, you know, kind of, that's something I've nurtured the last, you know, four or five years is just add as much as I can, um, you know, within reason every year on top of kind of what I'm doing and learning and changing and testing and trying, um, because, you know, the higher the level gets is like the more those things, the more those things matter um, alongside, you know, the hard work and trying to just physically get better. You're also adding, you know, ceramic this and low rolling resistance to add and, you know, fast, fast fabric here and all those kind of things. Then at the world level, everybody has that. So if you're not playing, playing that game or, you know, showing up to that fight with the right equipment, then you're kind of doing yourself a disservice. So, uh, education's, you know, part of that, you know, you don't see a football team not watching, um, game tapes or, you know, baseball teams not looking at statistics of the team they're about to, um, go up against. So it, cycling's no different. Yeah, absolutely. And then arming yourself with that information and know your competition, you know, it's obviously, it's a little, it's a little harder when you have kind of these, like these O cups and we get a lot of the same guys, but there's always these, Hey guys came in for just this one time. You're like, who's this guy? You know? And it, it makes that, makes it a little harder. Um, God, but that's Google. It's, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It, it, uh, there, there are ways, right. And it's a matter of yeah. investing in that and finding out and you start knowing who people are. And it's like, like I always say to guys like in the regional stuff, I'm like, don't, don't chase so-and-so they're, you know, cause you, you know, they're coming back on their own. I mean, there's certain ones where yeah. you're like, oh, no, I'm not just don't waste your energy. And other ones are like, don't let that guy get freaking 30 feet. Cause you're never getting them back. <laughs> you know stay on his wheel if you're gonna do anything you know so um but knowing your competition i think is is a huge one and to see you know you're really dialed in on that and uh and the equipment and here's the equipment one and maybe 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 you got uh, your take on it um but i've i've gone back and forth in this on on a 250 track is is it more or less advantageous to have a disc as opposed to a, a deep section arrow wheel because of the acceleration of basically changing direction? Um, and I don't know. I've kind of gone back and forth on whether or not I should use a disc or if I should use an arrow open wheel. And you know, and that's one of those marginal keys I haven't I haven't really determined for myself. I don't know if you have a if you have a, a take on that. Um, well, I've got I guess two things. It's like AM super fortunate that, you know, Araya takes care of me and my race disc is 770 grams. So I'm not really giving up anything True. on the weight side and I've got a full disc. Um, not everybody has that, <laughs> that privilege or that, um, opportunity, but you know, I would pick, you know, I choose arrow every day of the week over, you know, almost anything else. Um, 
I think every level is a bit different. Like, like your points race might be a lot more start stop than kind of my points race, right? So right. Um, that's something that is definitely considered. But I would, I would always arrow, err on the side of arrow um, versus weight, even though that is rotational. It's, I think it's pretty minimal, you know, on the track because you know you're still going from 30k to 50k. You know, it's not like you're going from 10k an hour to 60k an hour. Um, so I would choose, uh, you know, I, if it was me, like I'm riding a disc every time inside uh, on the rear, no matter what. Yeah, and, I, and I, I've kind of gone that way. Unless you know, I've ridden the um, the Lexus track in Detroit. Then I've I've yeah. ridden my open wheel instead of said the disc because it's, it's like 160 some meters around, right? So, and yeah. uh, basically doing a U turn in like 50 meters. Um, yeah, so that's like an old six day thing. Is like you you know if you look at all the six days up until like the last three years, you could see most everybody was on a deep dish wheel. Um, and they're actually just more comfortable on the small, steep tracks. They're, you know, they add a bit of compliance, um, yeah. and they're just comfortable to ride lap after lap after lap uh, for six days straight. And you know, back in the '90s, they were doing, you know, six days travel day, six days travel day. Like they were doing grand tours on the track, basically. Um, yeah, so they're just much more comfortable to ride on the the small tracks, and that's a a wise decision. Yeah, and I, I just feel like, you know, not like the yeah, comfortability, but, you know, like I say, I mean, the acceleration being a change in direction is like, man, yeah. you, you hit some G's in those turns and you're really cranking. And it's like, it's just the wheel feels better to me. And it's like, you know, I'm just always, I'm always picking the open wheel for there. But the 250, I'm always kind of tossed, but like, I don't know. But then, yeah, we get some of those fast races. And I, I'm getting old, man. I, I run <laughs> fast as crap as I can get my hands on. <laughs> yeah. So, it's like I'm like I'm taking the disc because I know it's gonna be fast and everybody's been gearing up too. So it's like yeah. geez, you know it's like we used to be I used to show up and be riding like a 94 inch gear and it's like maybe I'll show up with a 98 or a hundred now. It's like forget it, you know. It's like you're just yeah. hanging us back. Well, like I, how long am I gonna ride 130 RPM? You know, like I can't. Yeah. So, um, but I also you know looking at all all those things all those factors and i mean i could probably i could probably sit here and probably grab a beer and then talk to you for about four hours about the marginal gains of details and track because i love it um probably yeah <laughs> but you have you have some other you have some other passions too uh um outside of cycling um and do, do you apply those same things you, you you do some maybe a lot of people don't know that you do uh you you do some shooting um and you do some uh, some of your own reloading in that how does how does some of those same those same philosophies kind of play in for you? Yeah, I mean, like with the you know, I picked up shooting like ten years ago. Um, my cousin kind of got me to it, and a, and a really good friend of mine in California. There's like a shooting sports or shooting game like USP, USPSA, and it's just um, you know, there's like a stage that's set up that has multiple targets and barriers that you kind of have to like engage targets in you know the fastest possible way and manner so it's very tactical um and then there's just kind of like the therapeutic version of shooting like at the range where you're just trying to be as accurate as possible um and it just has helped me kind of get out of cycling or kind of um bad mindsets you go to the range like you you have to give the, the firearm the respect in the whole situation so that's all you're thinking about so it really clears my head and it's another good challenge to go try to be really accurate and you know that's can be this huge consuming process of trying to go to the range time after time and be as accurate or better than you were the previous time and um yeah and then that just the an evolution of that is yeah reloading your own ammo and that's changing you know how much powder you put in uh for a particular load or even how deep you seat a bullet um can all make a big difference on how accurate a firearm is. So it, it, you can really get off into the weeds on, yeah, marginal gains. If, you know, the, for the high precision stuff, guys, you know, buy a hundred pieces of brass and weigh each of them individually and separate them out by 0.1 of a grain. And then from there, they measure neck tension and separate them out again. And you can just really go off the deep end for this stuff. Um, so, kind of the level I'm at in the hobby that I have, it's, it's a good distraction when kind of the bike and the racing gets heavy and, uh, kind of starts going down into like a, not negative, but just into a, like away from a positive, happy vibe that I go distract myself 
uh, reloading and shooting and, um, you know, a couple of days later, come back to the bike with a kind of a reset um, mental state. Right. Yeah. When you, and you know, you, you throw off some, some terms that I, I only know a little bit about reloading. Um, my, my dad was an avid reloader. Right. Did yeah. all his, he haunted. And so he was constantly, he had one of those, he had those measuring things, right. There's this crony system thing where you, you shoot through it and it would measure bullet velocity. Right. So, yep. so he was measuring, you know, muzzle velocities and, you know, hitting targets, you know, 200 yard targets and what was the size of the groups. And, you know, then you get into this whole, which primers do you use? You know, then oh, you yeah. start all these experiments, right? You know, grains of powder and like you talk about separating out brass and you're kneeling brass after, after shooting them and how many do you get back in and how packed do you put the primer. And when you're talking grains and most people aren't, aren't, it's not like a like a, an individual grain of power. It's it's like 0. 0.06 grams. Yeah, it's, you're trying to weigh out like basically you know pepper granules or you know salt granules. Um, <laughs> you know individually, and there's scales that can measure that much. And there's tools now at this level that can detect if you're off by you know even a half or 0. 0.05 of a grain using you know. Um, yeah, muzzle velocity and, and, you know, feet per second that that's detectable in that different, you know, volume of, of powder. So when guys are trying to shoot a thousand yards or, you know, out to a mile and in that stuff, that's the difference between kind of hitting um, a 16 by 16 target or, or not. Um, right. Or if you're hunting, it's, you know, if there's like your trophy elk, um, it's 500 yards away, you know, like your margin of error is is really slim if you want a good clean you know shot on that animal and if you just kind of you you have the ability or there is the ability to to create really accurate ammo for your firearm to that you you know if you put the dot where you're supposed to and you know do your job the the bullet's going to go where it's supposed to go and um not leave anything up to to kind of chance if you will do you hunt um yes i mean i have not since not since i've lived in colorado um but I live in California. We go pig hunting and uh, with my dad and my mom, and uh, gone on a couple bear hunts. What what what'd you take with those? Um. So I've yeah I've shot two bears and we've I've shot like four pigs. Um, and it's delicious meat and it's just like a great time out. I mean, like it's definitely physically trying. I was like on one of my bear hunts was like. I was sore for a week. Like I couldn't eat cereal because my arms were so sore. Like I couldn't, I didn't wear a a shirt for a week because I couldn't get it on. Like my, I couldn't (laughs) after like, after field dressing the bear and, and carrying it out of this, you know, huge mountain. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't function. And it was like the most physically trying thing I've ever done. And it, yeah, it was all this unique version of satisfying. Um, and yeah, just, very much worth it. And then if we've been times out where we don't see anything or we, we do see stuff and we, you just could never make it into a, a reasonable shot range. And that's all part of the process and the experience of just kind of getting out there and out of what humans are used to into, you know, where something else lives and trying to, and try to beat it at its own game kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's some serious stuff. I bow hunt quite a bit in the fall. Oh, that's awesome. Just- for just deer, like, you know, just whitetail around us. But, uh, but I love it. Cause it's just, like you said, it's totally different, you know, and, and you got to yeah. get so close with the bow. I mean, I, I hunt with a gun a little bit too, but not like what you're doing with at that level. But, um, but I enjoy the bow with the bow. You can just, you see things move and everything's got to be very close and you got to get that exact shot. And it's my excuse for not racing cyclocross very much. It's really <laughs> just cause I suck at cyclocross, but like, you know, you're not missing anything thing. with cycle cross. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna miss what's what's out there? You're just gonna get dirty and cold. I know, I know. Yeah, I get cold in the tree stand instead. That's yeah. hard though. I get I have a, I have a tough time sitting up there for too long. I I hunt on my farm, so I can go out for you know an hour or three hours if I want and be back in my house pretty quick. But uh, yeah. I would I'd like to go with pigs. I think I've never yeah. done that before. That that sounds uh that sounds really cool. I was I was kind of into it a few years ago um reading about it and stuff like that but uh but i never actually went out and did it but that that seemed like a little more active kind of hunting too depending on how you're doing it 
Yeah, depending where you are and, and kind of the method you take, it's it can be like the most frustrating thing in the world, or it can be, yeah, just really trying and, and fun. And, um, you know, I've hunted with, you know, dogs and watching, you know, the the guy that owns the dogs and then how the dogs like operate and stuff is just, just amazing to, to watch that process. And then they just don't like stop a hundred yards down the road. Like pigs run for as long as they want to run <laughs> <laughs> right, and the right. dogs will be right behind them chasing. And then like, you've got to be behind them. And I don't know if you've ever tried to chase a dog. It's pretty hard. <laughs> so <laughs> right. it's like you, you're there with all your stuff, trying to chase these dogs, chasing pigs. And, um, it's, it's not easy and like it is it's it's a lot of hard work and, and they're smart man those are they're smart yeah. animals we raise pigs on the farm so we you know yeah. we, we have them there as far as that goes but year several years ago a long time ago i was i was a reporter in in central new york and we don't have wild pigs in new york state but there was a, a game farm and uh they had pigs that wild pigs that got out and they were oh. running around the state <laughs> lands there and i was working i was like a right out of college reporter and and I'd grown up deer hunting, so I was like, I'm gonna go shoot a pig up here and make a story <laughs> out of it. Like I thought this is the greatest idea ever, you know. And uh, and, and you need like you could just do whatever you wanted because they weren't they weren't native, so there was no rules on it. The DEC didn't want them there, so yeah. I was I went to the store and I bought pig food from a, a farm store and I just started spreading it around out in the <laughs> in the in the state forest where I was finding the digs and then sitting on it at night and trying to find them I had terrible luck with it but uh but it was a lot of fun to try to figure out for a little while yeah they're incredible creatures <laughs> they were probably uh, and they watching. taste delicious <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were watching Tony spread stuff out they're like dude we give it yeah. up man <laughs> like this jackass. Yeah, the closest I came, I kicked up a bunch of them in my car on a back road, and uh, I was tempted to like start blasting out the window, but I didn't want to get arrested. So that was the, the only time I actually saw them, other than just all the digs in the in the woods and stuff. But I walked in. I didn't. We we raise pigs now and stuff now, but back then I didn't know anything about them. So I like walk in this feed store, and I'm like this twenty four-year-old reporter and you know and i go to the farmer there i'm like i need some pig food and he's like what kind of pig food and i was like i don't know just some pig food i'm gonna go spread it around the woods and he's like what the hell is wrong with you, dude? <laughs> he's probably double charged you at that point oh i'm sure i'm sure but i just thought man what a great story if i kill one of these pigs and i can put it in the paper like i was all about I, I think you missed your collie i think i think you got a great story anyway <laughs> <laughs> oh man but uh yeah i mean hunt, hunting is one of those in in especially when you start reloading what, what caliber are you which what calibers are you reloading on your own um i'm like a me and my dad are like our big board guys so i shoot a lot of 45 um okay. acp you know kind of have a handgun and then yeah. i've got um a couple of 500 smith and wesson revolvers um that are just a ton of fun to shoot and uh always get all the right attention at a range. Um, and then on the rifle side, I have a 4570 um, lever gun that's like just a, a blast to shoot. Um, and then there's kind of a wild car cartridge called the 458 SOCOM that was developed for like the AR 15 platform that uh, I relo reload and, and shoot a lot of. Um, and yeah, just big, big calibers, um, big noise, big recoil. Yeah. Um, if you can't feel it, there's no reason to shoot it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's some big stuff. So you, you find out you but you hold hold on nice and snug or you or you or you pay the price. And you talk about when I was a kid and I was shooting my you know, my dad got me a, a three oh eight and I was like fourteen, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and it's like, man, I remember not being snugged up to the to the uh to the gun on that and hitting that trigger. And man, it's like it's like somebody punching you hard you know in that point of your shoulder right in the front and that got so sore i was like man then then you're afraid because now you know you're gonna get hurt so then you don't want to flinch right yeah so now 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 you got this this compounding thing going on because you know <laughs> that hurts so now i'm gonna now i start flinching now now it still hurts and i'm not hitting what i'm supposed to you know right. 
yeah, it was, uh, it was always a, an interesting experience. You know, I'm mean, shooting a 308 as like a 14 year old. Um, it was a, it's a pretty, pretty big caliber for a gun, but, uh, um, the whole reloading thing I think is just that it is, a, it becomes this fascinating thing. I think that's why my, my dad always liked it. Um, cause you could experiment around and it's really similar. And when you kind of look at it to what you do on the track, right. Yep. With, looking at all these little things and like how can i get a little squeeze a little bit more of this oh i'm not gonna i'm not gonna run this chain out of the bag because it's got all this factory lube on it's too slow and you know and it's just similar to i'm gonna put you know five grains less powder in this and i'm gonna use a different primer and i'm gonna use these different bullets and i'm gonna you know it's it's very similar in some ways but at the same time kind of gives you this this alternate place to be um and if you remember back um greg lamond was a was was a hunter cyclist as well um you, know, you remember that was that was his hunting accident that that uh that he had was hunting was a hunting quail or something like that that he was doing um but uh, i think it's just it's one of those activities where it's something that's kind of gets you out of the elements get you out of the, well, into the elements and out of the same element of, of cycling where it can be kind of consuming um do you especially find it in the track too i, I kind of find like sometimes you're in the infield and it's just so busy do you find sometimes like during big events you just got to leave the velodrome? Um, yeah, that's one thing that we um, definitely try to do, especially like in, in the omniums, um, is whenever you can kind of get out of the bright lights and the big noise and just let your central nervous system rest. You know, the the better off you'll you'll be. Because um, it's yeah, inside that beehive is this weird level of fatigue that if you just kind of sit there. You're not doing anything, but your body's just getting hammered with all this stimulus. Um, even if you got some headphones on, or um, you, you know, you're trying to fumble around on your phone, or whatever, there's still this this huge amount of stimulus. So, I definitely, you know, at the big races, try to eliminate as much of that artificial stimulus as um, as I can. That way, when it is go time, you're on the track. Um, all that stuff is really fresh and really awake um and not too tired that you can really focus on those those moments because yeah everything on the track besides the the points race in the omnium is like 15 minutes you know so it's it's a short amount of time that you have to be hyper hyper aware of um and so yeah the, the, definitely in the track it can be very tiring like at, at t-town on the omnium day we were there for 10 hours right um and that was just like by the time i got to the points race i was just like I'm tired, but I'm not like, it's just this unproductive tired or you're like, you don't like, you don't know why you're tired. You, you just feel so sluggish and slow. And then, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself the whole day, you get into that race and you're just like, oh, wow, it's taking me way too long to get engaged in this race and, and really start trying to figure it out. Um, so that's, yeah, the inside the velodrome is a big, big energy suck. Yeah, I remember talking to uh, Gordon Singleton about that before, and and when he was doing um, big races back in the day, you know, in the eight, early '80s, and uh, yeah, he would just have his road bike and just go out and ride the road just to get out of the noise, and and uh, and I've kind of adopted that. So on some of those long Milton days, if we're there for those O cups, and it's like, man, you know, you're going to be there from you know early in the morning, and you're there until through the evening, and it can be it's, it's that nine ten hour thing, right? And it's just like. I'm like man, if I even just just get out of this space for a little bit, it's the busyness. I think it just it's very tiring. And um, you know, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have hunting where you're like almost no stimulus. You're out, and if you're if you're like Tony and you're sitting there waiting for those pigs to show up, man, it's like <laughs> I there's... know, man. And I don't <laughs> yes. have, I don't sit still really well, so it's hard. That's why yeah. it's kind of why like that's why I like bow hunting is at least I get to see a lot, you know, especially when they're when they're mating and they're moving and, and at least they're moving around. Uh, so I don't do very well during gun season. I got to sit still and it's cold and I'm kind of a wimp and I want to go inside. And <laughs> it just doesn't work out, man. But uh, so I got another one for you and then uh, and then we can kind of let you go here. because You've been great to, to sit with us this long. But uh I don't know if this happens at your level, but certainly like for us, like amateurs, we get guys who kind of, they race for a while and then life catches up with them and then they don't really, you know, they're not racing anymore. They're not riding anymore. And you want your buddies to kind of like come back and, and kind of get back into it. So you always got that guy that you're like, Hey man, come on, come back, come back and race. You know what I mean? So yeah. 
I want to pretend that like you and me and Todd have a mutual friend. Like, let's say his name is Mike, just hypothetically. Like, like Mike Jones. <laughs> no, not Mike Jones. Mike's racing. Mike Jones. No, 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 not Mike Jones. He came back. He came back. He did. Yeah. And he's like, killing it. Yeah, like maybe Mike, Mike C, we'll call him. And and he, you know, isn't racing, and maybe he's got a little bit of a beer belly, and, you know, and we kind of want to get him back in the sport. So can you give us what you would do for a pep talk to get that guy cut, to come back? Like for the rest of us that have that friend that we got to give them that pep talk, like what would Daniel Holloway's pep talk be to get our hypothetical friend Mike back on the bike? Um, those situations, I like, I try to work on shame and guilt. <laughs> shame, and <laughs> guilt. Yeah. shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. And then right. remind him of the good old days. Okay. Uh, and just the taste of victory. So it's just like, I don't know, play cards with him and let him win and just have him like, you know, get that awe of what it feels like to win again thing. Cause that's like, that's so addicting. It's like winning, winning things and being successful. But I would also maybe just like break into his house and steal all his food. And just, you know, <laughs> maybe race weight is, is, is the first goal or 10 pounds. Uh, <laughs> beer. Yeah. But if this guy, this hypothetical Mike C guy, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would just work on shame and then positive reinforcement with artificial victory. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll steal his food and then we'll take him on a training ride and we'll let him win. We'll yeah. Him, we'll you have to really sell it. Like, you got to like pour water over your head to make it look like you're sweating right before the sprint. And then somebody wins and he looks over. It's like you, you worked really hard to yeah, pour the bottle of water. On your head, <laughs> really, you got to really play it up, but but it's going to be hard to play it up because he's going to be bonking because he's got no food. So um, it's going to it's going to it's going to be quite a it's going to be quite a setup here. So um, well, so that's if, if Mike, just like plan it so he gets into like just the fat burning state, gets into ketosis, and then so it's like you know it's like a three week process of stealing the food, and you got to get him through that first week of just like hangry and being just really grumpy. <laughs> and then, like, the ketosis will start to kick in, and then he'll start feeling better, and then he'll get through the bad fat into the good fat, and then, then he'll be humming along. So everybody's got to buy into the process. Yeah, I mean, you could market. You're going to market this thing. I can. I can. <laughs> yeah. Pep talks from Daniel Holloway. I love it. <laughs> pep talk. Need, need, a, need a good pep talk? Here, here's what you do. Man. People are going to be coming home from club rides and your food's going to be gone. They're going to be like, what the hell? Yeah, so if Mike C's listening to this, this podcast, he's going to know what's coming now. So, but, uh, or or I would be just find like a sworn enemy and just artificially make up some stories like that guy's talking a bit of trash that he Mike C will never come back and be as good as he once was and you know create some drama that way. Yeah that might work. a little bit of goss. Yeah, yeah I like that. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so good. Well, there you go. So you know pro pep talk tips from uh from, from Dan Holloway here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. So but thanks for uh thanks for being on with us uh Absolutely. and uh Really, really good to kind of hit some details, and um, I love the love the marginal gains thing, and uh, and all that stuff, and uh, see how it's gonna plays out in, in so many things, and um, definitely a definitely a fan, definitely love watching up at Milton, and uh, um, really looking forward to to seeing uh, the rest of your season goals with World Cups and uh, and on to Tokyo next year, man. So um, yeah, yeah. Cross, well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, man. We'll be rooting for you, and, and hopefully we'll come on again next time we need to talk about uh, music, too. So I was going to yeah. bring that one up earlier, but we didn't have time, but that's cool. We'll uh, save it for next time. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks.